Uh, right now, though, I want to welcome to the program Tom Stilson from BigGovernment.com. Tom, good evening to you, sir. Good evening, Pat. How are we doing tonight? <laughs> I am fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you for uh, using my new nickname. Uh, the folks at Media Matters for America sometimes uh, refer to me as uh, football coach Cam Cameron. Uh, and by the way, I'm sure that they're going to be listening tonight because they've already written about your piece uh, yeah. at, uh, at Big Government. U.S. government may be primary suppliers of Mexican drug cartel guns. Now, what you're talking about, Tom, mm -hmm. are the uh, not just the, the, the Operation Fast and Furious, which put thousands of guns in the hands of the cartel members, but legal sales uh, authorized by the State Department, authorized by the Defense Department to either uh, private companies in Mexico or to the Mexican military and Mexican law enforcement itself, right? Yes, sir, absolutely. Yeah, I, it, it all started for me at least. Um, I asked the question a few years ago of myself well, when looking at a few of the photographs uh, that a lot of the news reports are providing um, of the weapons that we see uh, in Mexico. I kind of looked at them, and you being knowledgeable about firearms as well would probably be aware of this. Uh, and I'm not going to propose that I'm the first person to ask this question by any means, but uh, looking at some of these M4 carbines, AR-15s, supposedly, uh, that we were seeing see some of the higher-resolution photographs, you could see that distinctive third pin in the rear of the AR-15, or M16 for that matter. Mm. And when you see that, you know that you see that third pin. It, it has a fully automatic trigger control group. Right. And when I saw that, I started asking the question, okay, realistically, how would they be getting fully automatic weaponry in the hands of the cartels? Well, the question we have to come down to, well, it's either coming from U.S. class three sources, the dealers in the U.S. are actually providing them, or you're seeing uh, the corruption within the Mexican military and or desertion rates within the Mexican military uh, providing these firearms. And obviously the, the, the two, uh, two former presumptions that our firearms dealers are actually providing these things was very unlikely given uh, the significant amount of arms control that we have here in the U.S. on exports. Um, and then in doing a little bit more research, I dug down, it, it came down to the simple fact of the matter that you've had, uh, within a period from 2003 to 2009, you've had more than 150,000 federal Mexican troops actually desert from their units. And more often than not, when they desert, it's generally been because of the allure of joining the cartels. Either the cartels threaten them and, their, and or their families, or the cartel in of itself has been able to provide better living conditions and better um, pay than the actual Mexican federal government was able to capable of doing. Yeah, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Media Matters for America, uh, their rebuttal to this is, well, you know, look, of the guns that were traced, um, only a, a small number of uh, these firearms were, were traced back to these programs. Mm -hmm. But what they don't point out is that the Mexican government doesn't trace every firearm that it recovers. In fact, uh, there are a lot of guns that they recover that they don't trace. Now, why would that be? What if you knew uh, upon seeing these guns that uh, <laughs> these guns were uh, at one time in the hands of the Mexican military or Mexican law enforcement? You might not actually want to run a trace on those firearms. Uh, absolutely not, because then in and of itself they lose their, um, uh, uh, so to speak, for lack of a better term, the government teeth is what they lose as a result of that. Uh, the federal government is in, uh, um, would have our own government, our State Department would have to then begin to reevaluate our own shipping of firearms down to the Mexican government. And, uh, you know, having prior experience within my family, uh, just as, as the detail and the level of the cor corruption, you know, if you've ever been down to Mexico, you're familiar with the phrase of mordida. Mordida is kind of a death pay, so to speak. It, it was the idea of you need to pay to get basic information. You need to pay off uh, you could pay off a federal, for instance, on a traffic stop with a couple hundred bucks right. uh, and not get a ticket, uh, whether you violated traffic laws or not. And that's very rampant, particularly within the Mexican federal police force. Um, when what, Where Media Matters missed the boat entirely, and it was kind of funny because they provided my counterargument uh, already prepared for me uh, by simply clicking on their link for the ATS response to Senator Grassley's letter. Um, the ATF in and of themselves actually kind of uh, they admit that, look, we're only able to review so many guns, and it's what the Mexican government wishes, wishes to provide us with. The estimated number, uh, I think the number off the top of my head was 27,000 firearms that the Mexican government provided us with. But in reality, the Mexican government actually has 305,000 firearms as of the time of that letter seized in their vaults. That they did. So in other words, they provided us with less than 10% of the overall guns that they actually have in their possession currently. 
And it's very easy for the Mexican government to have sat there and not provided us with firearms that originated from U.S. defense manufacturers and were channeled through the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls or another State Department outlet. It was very easy for them to be able to hide that. Yeah, oh, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Now, Media Matters is wondering where that uh, 300,000 uh, gun figure comes from. Um, uh, Tom, are you referring? I, I know that there was an Associated Press story a couple of years ago. One of the uh, reporters based in Mexico City was uh, actually given access to uh, one of the warehouses, and there are several around the country that, that house guns that have been seized by the Mexican government and military. Uh, and she said uh, in her report that there were, I want to say, something like 350,000 firearms that the uh, government had seized, uh, far below the number that the uh, government has reported over the last couple of years, mm-hmm. and, again, uh, well, well well above the, uh, the number uh, that uh, have actually been turned over and submitted for tracing. Absolutely, absolutely, and that in of itself uh, proposes the question. Uh, Media Matters cites that well, only 346 of those uh, were potentially from other countries. Well, that number doesn't really get down to the root of it necessarily, because again, you're getting to the point that there are almost 200, or actually over 280,000 firearms that are unaccounted for that the ATF didn't do any trade. So you're sitting there trying to make um, a conclusion, and I'm, I'm a scientist by trade, a geologist and environmental chemist. Um, you're trying to make a, a, um, a conclusion based upon an incomplete uh, data set is the best way to describe that. And you're basically talking, they go, well, look, it's in reality, if those firearms all came from the U.S., the 346 that Media Matters cites, in reality that would mean 0.1% of all guns uh, that were seized from the cartels uh, actually came from U.S. Uh, uh, Secretary of State-based uh, programs, if you will. That in of itself just kind of raises the question because it, it doesn't seem like a very realistic number. That's an unbelievably low number, particularly with the desertion rates that you see within the Mexican military. I mean, 150,000 guys leave. A few of them are going to take their guns with them, and a few of them are going to go join the cartels. I mean, that, the, the Zetas themselves were started by a former Special Forces um, a CIA-trained group mm-hmm. within Mexico that was supplied by United States Defense Department. Well, absolutely. And look, I mean, we know that um, we, we know that this has happened. We know that uh, deserting soldiers have not only taken their, uh, their rifles with them, in some cases they've taken the attack helicopters that uh, they were piloting with them yep. uh, and, and gone over to the Zetas. We know that the uh, cartels, uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, one of the uh, uh, guys in uh, President Calderon's security detail was actually uh, arrested and charged with uh, being on the payroll of one of the cartels to the tune of $100,000 a month. And among the uh, the things that he was supposed to do to earn that money, he was supposed to keep track of Calderon uh, so that he could tell the cartels where Calderon was going to be so they could stay away from the area, given the uh, you know uh, increase in security forces that would be around the president. Uh, but he was also supposed to aid in the training and acquisition of weapons for the cartels. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is a guy who was able to make purchase orders for, uh, uh, for guns, and from what I understand, uh, this uh, a group that he was with, the military uh, group that he was with, uh, did make a purchase for some firearms that um, seemed to be a little out of the ordinary. Yeah. So, it, you know, if this is happening not just at the lower level where the, you know, the corrupt chiefs of police are... Uh, being told by the cartels, all right, go ahead and order us, you know, 50 or 100 guns. Uh, when, when, when you get them, turn around and give them to us. I mean, it really does seem like this corruption stretches all the way up to the highest levels of government uh, and is a real endemic problem that, frankly, the Mexican government doesn't want to acknowledge. Uh, and, and I don't think the Obama administration really wants to acknowledge it either because they would rather say that the problem is our gun laws. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, when it comes down to the uh, nitty-gritty of all this, uh, corruption within government is something that we have to learn to accept. In reality, people are going to be corruptible. It doesn't mean it's something we need to accept in terms of we need to just go ahead and let it happen. We also understand the corruptible nature of most individuals, particularly in an area like Mexico where uh, the poverty rate is just through the roof. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's very easy for you to buy and sell, if you will, Uh, even high-level officials within Mexico. And that's not to expect that that would not carry over here. However, what we're seeing now more than likely is we're seeing a political uh, basis to it. Um, There's an end game here beyond just maybe getting a little bit of uh, an agent's palm grease, so to speak. Uh, Instead, what we're seeing here is the Obama administration trying to sell the narrative that, well, no, the U.S. is supplying these guns. It's because of our lax gun laws. Therefore, we need greater gun restrictions. 
and that's clearly not the case. Rather, what it is um, is programs like Operation uh, Fast and Furious uh, that are allowing these guns to walk across the border and or potentially, as my article outlines, um, it's individuals that are we're shipping it over there and just turning a blind eye to it. And when a rational person would look at the circumstances and say, something doesn't seem right here. We are shipping a lot of guns down there. We keep shipping guns down there. The desertion rates are through the roof. Um, and yet these guns keep turning up at crime scenes. You, you, you know, it doesn't take a, um, a, a genius to be able to look at some of these photographs and identify these firearms as military weaponry, not just civilian, but military weaponry. Right. Well, I, you know, again, I mean, the, the, the cartels, uh, given that they have no regard for Mexican law or U.S. law, uh, I think are going to get guns anywhere and any way that they possibly can. I, I don't think that they're relying on any one uh, means to do this. We know, for instance, that they're actually uh, going into Honduras uh, mm-hmm. and, and engaging in raids on military depots, military armories. We know that they've actually uh, waged attacks on Mexican military bases. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that, that uh, Mexican prison officials have actually, in some cases, supplied cartel members with guns and keys to a prison vehicle so they can go drive off, uh, conduct a hit, and then drive back to prison afterwards. I mean, you know, w- when, you, when you actually start to look at the totality of everything that's going on and how screwed up things are in Mexico right now, uh, the idea that uh, uh, even imposing every one of Mexico's gun laws on us here in the United States would make a difference is laughable. It really is. I mean, it's the, it's the concept of giving a baby a butcher knife. It just doesn't make any sense. What we're doing is we're knowingly giving these firearms to a country that, like I mentioned previously, the corruption rate is through the roof. Um, and to expect anything different is very, very, uh, it's a childish point of view. And rather, what we need to do is begin to look at the actual issues in and of itself and begin to address a, a different strategy, whether it be um, efforts at rather than directing all these finances, for instance, within the State Department. Uh, Bush's last year in office, um, from the numbers that I found, it was around $7 million the State Department funneled down to Mexico. When you actually look at the figures today, it's over $350 million dollars the first year Obama got into office, that's the most recent data that we have available for that. Um, what, what it is is it's uh, um, sticking your hand on a hot stove again and again and again and expecting a very, very different result. Um, and our government is either doing that because they're stupid, which oftentimes can be the instance. Uh, we know that government is not the most efficient of creatures, but it's also the understanding that there might be an ulterior motive to this. And that's effectively what my article proposes, is that you can only do it so many times before we kind of have to ask the question, are you doing it intentionally? Is, are you doing this with purpose to try and present an argument? And if it's a disarmed American citizen, then in and of itself it follows the next line in question, uh, the next question in line. Well, why are you trying to disarm American citizens, or at least restrict their God-given constitutional rights? Yeah. And the answer to that question is a very dangerous one. In my personal opinion, well, I think you're right, Tom, and I hope that uh, you know the, as the investigation into Fast and Furious continues, uh, I hope that we're able to get some answers. Uh, but you know, look, all you have to do is, is see what this administration has done in the uh, first three years while they're in office. I know Media Matters for America says, uh, uh, and I want to make sure that I quote them: prioritize, um, uh, yes, yes, uh, uh, gun uh, restriction pr- a priority, which they really haven't. <laughs> They, they, they've, done, they've made uh, um, uh, uh, uni- uh, universal health care and unicorns raining down from the sky their priority. Um, but it hasn't really been firearms, but they have made several attempts at it and failed. And I, I forget who it was that said, I believe it was maybe Senator Feinstein, that said eventually we will get the firearms. It's just a matter of when. Right now is not our time. Right. Uh, yeah, and uh, Sarah Brady uh, commented that President Obama told her that uh, they're working on gun control, but they've got to do it under the radar. Uh, we've seen, you know, two very anti-gun appointees to the Supreme Court uh, mm-hmm. under President Obama. We saw the uh, 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 president, uh, or the attorney general, rather, in the very early days of the administration say he wanted to bring back the uh, semi-auto ban. President Obama concurs. Again, he hasn't pushed it. He said that there's not the political will uh, to bring it back. In Congress right now, but he 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 wants to do it. He's made no uh, no bones about it, uh, and he has gone after uh, border state FFLs with new regulations that uh, that are now being challenged in court. 
Yeah. Uh, very recently, uh, the, the Bureau of Land Management trying to make it more difficult for people to shoot recreationally on public lands. There's been a lot of nibbling at the edges, uh, and there certainly has not been any indication that the president uh, is uh, anything close to a friend or even neutral on this issue when it comes to the Second Amendment. Absolutely. And that's the thing is that an individual's words and an individual's actions, uh, actions always speak louder than words, but uh, President Obama's words have been one of uh, a lot of restraint, I guess, if you will, is probably the best term to describe that, is he has realized, uh, understood that there's going to be a time and a place for him to act and for him to do the things, quote, unquote, necessary uh, for him to, to institute gun legislation and or gun control. And it very, may very well end up being uh, an issue of regulation, as we've seen, as you mentioned, with the border states. And President Obama's already done this with um, student loans and other financial issues uh, where he says, well, if the do-nothing Congress won't uh, act, then I'm going to act. And whether it's constitutional or not, he's going to issue an executive order. And that's a very significant concern that we should have right now is uh, if Obama looks at the executive order more as a king's edict rather than a responsibility that should be taken very, very uh, um, with, that should be uh, taken, proceeded forth with a heavy heart, understanding that there's certain limitations in the Constitution. And I, I don't foresee that with him if he does go that route. All right. Well, listen, Tom, glad you could join us on the program tonight, sir. Uh, look forward to having you back on again soon and uh, have a happy Thanksgiving to you. All right. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too, as well, Fats. And uh, thank you very much. You have a good one, Cam. <laughs> Tom Stilson joining us from uh, biggovernment.com. You know, not quite as funny being called Fats twice in one interview. First time around, it was kind of funny. It was really funny when I brought it up. And then when, the, when Tom said it, it was really funny the first time. Second time, not quite so funny.